Almost three weeks ago, I released part one of my early 2022 RDNA 3 leaks. To be fair, there were other important leaks before that video, one that was just kind of a prologue to these leaks that you're seeing here today, and others from the last year that had a lot of important details about RDNA 3 and RDNA 4 that, to be fair, people probably should remind themselves has already been said. But... The reason I did Navi 33 as the big configuration to do a part one on this year for RDNA 3 is that, well, it's the first RDNA 3 configuration, if not amongst the first, to launch by quarter four. So chronologically, it just made sense to talk about Navi 33 before Navi 31. But also, Navi 33 aims to bring Navi 21 1080p performance, which is AMD's previous gen flagship, to a much smaller and cheaper to make package which means yeah it's a good part one to demonstrate how impressive rdna3 is by itself without a bunch of fancy tech and amd's done this before to be clear rdna2 massively increased efficiency between similar sized dies without a node shrink and it even added turing level ray tracing on top of it and Look, I like Turing probably more than I think most PC gamers do. I appreciate what it managed to do on a similar node to Pascal while adding ray tracing. But it does have to be noted that Turing had a slightly better node than Pascal. And while it added ray tracing, it didn't do so without also needing a bigger die. RDNA 2 managed to save on die space, massively increase efficiency on literally the same node as RDNA 1. And it added ray tracing. Just like a full node shrink and fancy tech wasn't needed to make RDNA 2 impressive over RDNA 1, the fancy stuff is not required to make RDNA 3 impressive over RDNA 2. But unlike Navi 33, Navi 31 is fancy. And AMD has been hinting at its fanciness for a while now. We were also the leaders in advanced packaging technology. Our investments in innovation and packaging have been a multi-year, multi-technology journey. In 2015, AMD introduced high bandwidth memory, or HBM, and silicon interposer technology to the GPU market, which led the industry for memory bandwidth in a small form factor. We then set a new performance trajectory for compute in the data center and PC markets in 2017 when we introduced high volume multi-chip module packaging. And in 2019, we introduced chiplets using different process nodes for the CPU cores and the I.O. in the same package, which enabled significantly higher performance and capabilities. Now, today, I'd like to show you the next big step forward. The first application of this technology will be to enable a 3D vertical cache. So all of this, AMD 3D vCache, we introduced this. Computex 2021, it will be available in market in 2022. I hope this helps you understand how AMD 3D vCache works. And the thing I want to leave you with is that it's not just cache we can use this technology on. We can use hybrid bond 3D for more than cache. It could be uh, GPUs, CPUs, memory, flash. The, the possibilities are endless with this technology. And who knows what the future might hold. But the key here, the thing to remember, is that this 3D vCache technology is just the beginning and it will help AMD grow chips vertically. AMD has crazy things coming. And in fact, I'm aware of quite a few insane APUs, professional cards, and gaming architectures with a host of new types of interconnects and next-gen cache implementations that will keep driving what Lisa Su has recently called a technological mega cycle. That technological mega cycle, I would say, was kicked off with RDNA 2 and Ampere. And it's just getting started, though. Today's video is about detailing what I know for sure right now about RDNA 3, and in fact, also what I can confirm about an MI300 variant I'm aware of that should give everybody a good idea of the crazy stuff that's coming to gamers after RDNA 3. But first, an ad from a sponsor. Well, it's officially spring, which for me and my dog Reese means getting outside and growing some fresh food in our garden. And also, it means having to mow the lawn every week, having to take care of weeds, and just having to maintain the yard in general, which means that, yeah, during the spring and summer months, I like having a quick snack that I can make so I waste as little time as possible now that I'm spending more time taking care of my yard. But I also, of course, want it to be healthy and tasty. And, well, yeah, that's where Vite Ramen comes in. Vite Ramen is an American company that, just like me, likes using fresh ingredients to make meals tasty, 
and healthy. And it only takes a few minutes to make. And they keep updating their recipe, like the V3 edition of Beef Pho recently, to keep ensuring their product is as good as it can be. So make sure, even if you bought them before, you check back at their store. And if you do, click on the link in the description and use the offer code Broken Silicon to save 10% on a special bundle just for Moore's Law Z fans. That gives you $25 in free goodies, and it really does help support this channel tremendously. Seriously, I eat Vite Ramen. It's tasty, it's healthy, it's fresh. And it's especially reasonably priced if you use the Moore's Law is Dead deal. Try Vite Ramen today. All right, now that we've talked about Navi 33, let's start talking about Navi 31 and a little bit of Navi 32. Although first, a disclaimer, I've probably been a little overly cautious about what I'm confirming in today's video. There's a couple of key details I've stopped just short of saying because I think I'm going to know much more from many more sources very soon. And so, well, just like I updated key details after my initial Lovelace leak, like the 600 watt total board power for the RTX 4090, I'll do the same with RDNA 3. But today, what I want to confirm is everything that you can take to the bank for sure. And I honestly think this is enough to tell you what to expect out of RDNA 3's launch later this year anyways. But in, let's get into it. So at this point, almost all sources indicate that Navi 31 is 3D stacked and Navi 32 is multi-die if not 3D stacked. And look, it shouldn't surprise actually anyone if RDNA 3 manages to be 3D stacked, as if you look at TSMC's roadmap for 3D stacking, well, you can see that N5 on top of N6 is ready literally when RDNA 3 is supposed to launch. So all of this lines up with public information. But technically, I can 100% confirm 3D stacking from all sources, although none deny it, and some of them are 100% sure it's 3D stacked. Now, internally at AMD, the 6 nanometer dies are referred to as MCDs, and the 5 nanometer dies are referred to as GCDs. This is double confirmed by quite a few sources, actually. So if you see those terms, those are the real terms, at least internally at AMD. Now, Navi 31. 100% multiple dies. 100%. This is a major advantage over Lovelace AMD has here that I already talked about why it's an economical advantage in a previous video. And these are most likely 3D stacked 5 nanometer compute dies on top of 6 nanometer IO and Infinity Cache dies. And it should have 512 megabytes of Infinity Cache with for sure a 256 bit memory controller via at least one MCD. Now, technically, based on how this architecture is organized, the Navi 31 architecture, I think. 256 megabytes is possible, but right now the consensus is 512 is more likely. Although I don't think 256 should be entirely ruled out. Now, one source points to there being at least three SKUs from this configuration. And honestly, this one is tricky how they're going to segment. I'm sure I'll do another big lake where I go over all of that when it's confirmed. But look, Navi 33 is 8 gigabytes, 99% chance. And of course, looking at 256-bit, Navi 31 could be up to 32 gigabytes. But depending on NVIDIA's competitiveness, I could see a situation where AMD gives all of their top SKUs 32 gigabytes. Although I would expect the bottom one to be 16 gigabytes. But depending on what happens with Navi 32... 16 gigabytes may be a problem for segmentation purposes. So what I would just say is, yeah, they're going to have a big old flagship and they're going to have a mainstream gaming card that is really powerful. But for now, it's hard to say exactly if all of them are 32 gigabytes, if most of them are 16 gigabytes or what they're going to do with segmentation because there's still time to decide that. Now, the performance, which is the most important thing I'm sure most of you want to hear. 90 to 130 percent over the RX 6900 XT and rasterization. And I would caution people from just reporting it's plus 130% or 130 means it's going to be 150 actually because a lot of my sources hate the bullshit Navi 3X and 4X leaks that have been going around for over a year. You really got to not listen to the people saying that stuff's going to happen. That is an insane performance increase in one generation where they're also going to massively increase ray tracing. Power consumption, the original target for Navi 31 was 375 watts. You know, that's so it can use two 8 pins and PCIe power. There are some ceilings to power consumption with how Navi 31 is designed, unlike Lovelace, that you can just keep clocking as much as you want since it's monolithic. But I think you can take to the bank that the top-end enthusiast card that isn't an insane Halo card decided to be launched next to a 600-watt Lovelace. 375 to 450 watts. This is massively more efficient than what NVIDIA is doing with Lovelace. And 
PCIe 5.0 times 16. Not 100% sure, but again, just like I said, PCIe 5.0 times 8 for Navi 33. I'm pretty dang sure on that by now, and I expect to be 100% sure soon. Now, this card is launching, or these cards are launching quarter four 2022. That is still the current target. Of course, they could pull it up a little bit, but the plan was always quarter four. And as far as I am hearing, talking to my sources, that has not changed. Now, Navi 32, I'm actually going to hold back on saying too much on this one because, well, it comes out later. Look, it's 100% multiple dies, 5 nanometer compute die, 6 nanometer IO plus infinity cache dies, most likely just a smaller organized version of how Navi 31 works. But I can't comment on, I can't commit to exact performance just yet since this one is farther out. But again, I think you can conclude where it's probably going to be right. If Navi 33 is Navi 21 performance and Navi 31 doubles that, I think you can expect it to be at least 20% better than a 6900 XT. I think this is likely what's going to go into like maybe a 7700 XT and 7800 XT. Again, segmentation, it depends. And I do expect it though to be 30 to 50% better. Now, first half 20 23 launch. This may surprise some people because this is a different rollout schedule than what's happened with RDNA 2, but Navi 33, Navi 31, then Navi 32, that's what's going on. And that's why I'm not committing to as much information because to be honest, the sources that I know that have never been wrong, that 100% are not full of shit, not people that just know a guy that know a guy and know a guy that just emails someone every now and then, they're sure that it's not coming out this year, and that's why information from these types of ironclad sources is just a bit more scant. Another interesting tidbit I'm throwing in here for fun. RDNA 4 is planning to use GDR7, or at least it was as of a month ago, but it actually sounds like some things are changing based on TSMC's 3 nanometer issues. And these 3 nanometer issues have been corroborated by Daniel Nenny, the founder of SemiWiki.com, and I really trust that guy, so... For now, I actually I actually was going to say a little bit about RDNA 4 in this one, but I'm going to pull back. What you need to know is that it is probably not as big of an increase as RDNA 3 in performance over RDNA 2, but that it is not a you know small 50% bump. It's another big increase, probably using GDDR7, and it seems to borrow a lot from the more crazier designs that I'm aware of, like MI300. These are elaborate 3D stacking designs that AMD has been hinting at publicly. It's clear that this type of 3D stack tech is coming by RDNA 5, if not RDNA 3. And at the very least, I am 100% sure Navi 31 and Navi 32 are multi-die. In fact, this is something that AMG engineers are just starting to openly admit over coffee now. They're like, yeah, he uses multiple dyes. So that's it's just so crazy confirmed. If anyone is still doubting that RDNA 3 uses both 6 nanometer and 5 nanometer dyes and combines them. But what makes me sure that the future of AMD architectures has 3D stacking fairly soon? Well... Wait until you see what an MI300 variant I became aware of a month ago looks like. And I do literally mean see. I got pictures. Let's start talking about MI300. All right. MI300, or at least a variant that I'm aware of. And I do need to be clear about that up front here. That this is something I do have multiple inputs from from sources, including pictures, but that it seems like there are some radically different variants of MI300 floating around out there. What I don't know is if other ones are going to come to light, or if this is just a maybe final one that has beaten the other designed options. The one I'm detailing today is just one I'm familiar with. All right, then. The MI300 design I'm familiar with is organized in the following ways. It has a bottom layer that is occupied by a massive interposer, 200, 2,000, I'm sorry, 750 millimeter squared for the largest configuration I've seen. Remember, these interposers are dumb. The Fury X had over a 1,000 millimeter squared interposer. And right now, TSMC is talking about four times reticle size for interposers. So this fits perfectly with when MI300 is supposed to launch. Now, on top of this interposer that holds everything are a series of rectangular 6 nanometer tiles that house I.O. controllers, IP blocks, and likely cache, although I'm not 100% sure. And they're actually not that big, about 320 to 360 millimeter squared per 6 nanometer tile. And each tile has connections for two stacks of HBM3. And these tiles are 12 plus metal layers, which is important for those who design silicon because it tells you 
it seems to have the ability to be as complex as alchemist die that I actually know from internal documents is also 12 or more metal layers. These are not dumb six nanometer tiles. They're capable, uh, they hose a lot, of, house a lot of complex things or IP blocks. Now, the six nanometer dies were built to work with multiple products that can be stacked on top, which is really exciting because on top of each of these six nanometer tiles, at least in this variant, are two five nanometer compute tiles. The ones I've seen are around 110 millimeter squared per five nanometer tile, but I think there's room for a little bit of bigger ones on top of there. And again, they're just called compute tiles. There's been references to graphics tiles and all different types of tiles that you could use with this. And the five nanometer tiles I've seen thus far actually have multiple arrays of cells that look like compute units, totally in numbers that, well, I'm not going to say how many compute units it looked like they fit in a 110 millimeter squared tile because I don't know if they're placeholders. I think there's a lot of espionage going on at AMD where different groups don't know different things the other groups know. So I'm not going to say it because it just seems like an unrealistic number of compute units, but it's a ton. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was kind of just like placeholder blank spaces for other compute IP blocks being designed by other design teams. However, it does need to be noted that I've been told there are many types of compute dies that consumers will choose from. And so I also, even though it seems unrealistic, can't rule out that what I am seeing in these five nanometer compute tiles is either a blank array to be populated by different IP blocks, like I said, or cells that are compute units insanely stripped down for only doing, for example, FP32. Like, I don't know. Maybe you can fit just you know, double the compute units you could before on five nanometer if you design an architecture around just doing FP32. But if you need to do more than FP32, you put a different type of compute tile on top of those six nanometer IO tiles. Now, how is this connected? There are 20,000 connections between each die. And I have, I'll show you pictures. I have details of like these little ribbons of connections between the five nanometer to the six nanometer, each one, and then also between six nanometer to six nanometer tiles organized around them. Now, for those who don't know, that is double what Apple is using to connect the dies and the M1 Ultra. So yeah, what a Apple impressively started with the M1 Ultra, AMD is doing doubly impressively so. And PCIe 5.0 support. All right, now let me actually show you what this thing looks like. And I think it's important because I believe there's all different types of priced products AMD can make for the professional market here. Like if you want a smaller, cheaper, meant for embedded one with just one six nanometer or two six nanometer tiles and four HBM3 stacks, they can do that. Or they can, as Intel used to call it, glue more together through those 20,000 connections and up to eight times HBM3 stacks on that massive 2,750 millimeter squared interposer with four six nanometer tiles. They can do both. They can have a small one that might fit in, God, who knows, just really small form factors or these massive, crazy, powerful server ones. And each one of those six nanometer tiles with two five nanometer compute tiles on top of it uses about 150 watts right now. Thus, the top configuration with four six nanometer eight compute tiles uses around 600 watts unless, again, AMD decides to push it further. But that tells you what AMD is able to do here. This is an insane level of compute using 600 watts. That's less than Hopper. I think Hopper's in trouble, guys. And unfortunately, though, well, I think Hopper's in trouble. I don't have performance numbers right now besides power consumption. But based on the amount of silicon and bandwidth, I mean, come on. It's very safe to say that this will at least double the performance of MI250X. That's a crazy low ball probably too. And remember that it's likely to have various types of 5 nanometer dies for specific uses. So if you build one of these, you know, like ordering a hamburger, what do you, you know, what type of bun do you want? What type of compute die do you want? I think it's a chance you could have insanely more powerful configurations if you target one for a specific task. And at this point, I am told in these compute tiles, there are not connectors for Vcache on top of them for this variant. But again, it must be emphasized that AMD could very possibly just not have included that in this particular variant. And seeing this crazy variant of MI300, I hope now you can see why... I am confident RDNA 3 could have 3D stacking. This is what they're working on for professional. RDNA 3 actually looks kind of tame if it's 3D stacked. And I am sure AMD is going to have crazy 3D stacked elaborate gaming architectures by RDNA 5. But will they buy RDNA 4 that look like MI300? It's hard to say. Although 
what I've heard and what I've heard other people say publicly as well is that RDNA 4 is uh, TSMC 3 nanometer stacked on, to- stacked on top of TSMC 5 nanometer. And again, if we go back to that TSMC stacking chart, 3 on top of 5 will be ready by the end of 2023, which is when I was told AMD was trying to launch RDNA 4, but I also told things are changing. And so... Well, we're just going to have to see, but I hope it's clear why I combined Navi 31 and MI300 in this video that took probably too long for me to get out. It's because, though I'm mostly sure that Navi 31 and probably 32 are 3D stacked, I am 100% sure about MI300, and I have renders of MI300. Now, note those renders are based on real designs that I have seen. Little things on there are kind of guessed at how it would look to make it look cool, but that is roughly what that thing looks like the renders you've seen of Navi 33 and Navi 31 that I've shown in thumbnails and such that's not like I'm just randomly pulling what it looks like out of my ass but it is not based on exact schematics I've seen but either way now you see what MI 300 100% is going to be in well probably about a year from now and if that's what they're going to have about a year from now for the professional market I think it's clear to see why RDNA 3 could also be 3D stacked and why certainly by RDNA 5 we will have 3D stacked products as well. All right, now that I've dropped the majority of the bombshells this video has, let's start getting into some closing thoughts. First one on Navi 33. Remember the gist of what Navi 33 is. Navi 33 aims to bring Navi 21 1080p performance to a much, much, much cheaper package. But I don't expect it to win in all games and resolution scenarios. Who knows if that's just with ray tracing yet? And we're going to have to see how that turns out. And then as for Navi 31 and Navi 32... I'm very confident that AMD is going to win efficiency this generation, and I'm mostly confident that they will win performance. You know, I said 90 to 130% over a 6900 XT in rasterization, and I said that Lovelace has 80 to 110%. So the AMD range is above the Lovelace range, but I really don't think we can rule out that it's going to be roughly a tie again this generation, but one with AMD using way less energy and probably costing less to make with a lot of their products. Yeah, I know that Navi 31 and 32 have extra packaging costs being multi-die, but they're also putting a lot of that silicon on 6 nanometer, which is way cheaper than 5 nanometer. And this normalized cost of combining dies from a more expensive node and a cheaper node is something AMD has started to talk up more and more very recently, I believe in preparation for making it clear to investors that they don't just have a technological advantage with RDNA 3, but it is not coming at the cost of, well, the cost to produce these products, that they can beat NVIDIA in price and in performance and it's not just because of the packaging because the lower cooling does matter for how much the overall bomb cost is on these graphics cards so really i expect amd to have a pricing advantage in the high end and in the lower mid-range with navi 33 it's really The RTX 4060 and RTX 4070, if NVIDIA doesn't go as ham with power consumption, those are the high-volume, mid-range, lower, high-end products that I think NVIDIA could have very competitive pricing. I mean, either way, NVIDIA can probably get away with making lower margins on this upcoming generation. But I'm saying, like, literally, if it's margin to margin, I think that's where NVIDIA can surgically strike. But that surgical strike really does depend on Navi 33. Like, how impressive is that going to be? I think it could be a perfect foil to the 4060 and 4070 in pricing anyway. So, yeah, I think things are going to be really competitive this generation in gaming. And, um, well, I do hear that Lovelace Professional is going to be competitive in efficiency with AMD. At least that's what it sounds like. It's using normal GDR6. Again, not GDR6X. I'll be the first to confirm that as well, along with my uh, professional Lovelace power consumption stuff I confirmed recently. And, um, yeah, I mean, again, competitive between AMD and NVIDIA. I don't know, but what about Intel? Honestly, who cares Intel Battle Mage at this point? Look, I, I, I do think people are honestly underestimating what Intel could do with the perfect window with Alchemist. Like, you know, I have heard that Ampere and RDNA 2 stock will probably dry up by July. And so if, if Intel manages to launch a decent desktop lineup in high volume for even just one month in July, they could fill a month that NVIDIA might be abandoning to dry up supply before Lovelace's launch. But that's what they're going to have to do, and that's really the best we can hope for right now. It's it's not going to end up being competitive with Lovelace and RDNA 3, and I guess, well, 
on the subject of Intel, I do also want to point out at the end of this video, now that I have a chance, that I linked in video was talking to Intel about using their fabs a year ago, despite some recent claims that's not actually new information. What is new for me, though, is that those talks seem to still be going on, and that is a new thing I can tell you guys right now, that just behind the scenes, NVIDIA contacts keep bringing up Intel's fabs in the U.S. And that's exciting because that tells me that we really should probably expect an NVIDIA product as a test run on an Intel fab sometime in the next few years. It's seeming less and less like just a phone call and more and more like NVIDIA wants to dip their toes in those waters as AMD dips their toes in just dominating the best technology TSMC has to offer. Um, but, uh... Well, uh, yeah, that's going to do it for this AMD video. I hope you enjoyed it. Please remember to like this video. Double check that you're subscribed. YouTube can unsubscribe you. Ring the bell button so you don't miss those upcoming leaks following up on this one about RDNA 3. And uh, consider, you know, checking out the new Broken Silicon, subscribing to Broken Silicon on a podcast app, giving it a review on Apple Podcasts or your podcast app of choice. And note that... Patrons get that early and ad-free and can ask guest questions. We have an upcoming guest very soon who is an incredible overclocker and just does really good tests of CPUs. And we're going to openly talk about the 5800X3D versus a handful of Alder Lake products, which one is best at which, and who should be buying what. So if you want to submit your thoughts about what you think about the 5800X3D, submit them as a patron, and we're going to talk with them with an, about them with an expert. But otherwise, well, that's going to do it for this video. Thank you for watching.